Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your favorite quarterback hater, Robert Mathis, and you're listening to the For the Culture Podcast. This is the For the Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, with my man, Jason Spears, and it's finally here, the week one game preview. The Colts hosting the Seattle Seahawks, 1 o'clock on Fox, Lucas Oil Stadium. We got off to a great start last night in the NFL. Bucks, Cowboys came down to a game-winning kick. It was basically whoever had the ball last was going to win that game. And now you feel it in the air, the fall, that crispy fall kind of September, October weather. Football weather, it's here. You could smell it. You could feel it. The Colts play on Sunday. Tough opponent the first couple weeks. We have Seattle. We have the Rams. We have the Titans. We have the Titans twice in the first five or six weeks. So it's going to be a tough start to the season. But the season is here nonetheless. And before we get into the game preview, another Colt from the class of 2018 got an extension to close out the offseason, if you will. First it was Smith, then it was Leonard. Now it's Naheem Hines getting a three-year $18.6 million extension. 12 of that 18.6, so about two-thirds of that contract is guaranteed. And Naheem Hines, for a position that is not durable by any stretch of the imagination, the running back position, he's been nothing but durable. Not that I want to jinx it, knock on wood. But when you look at this team and all the injuries we've had, and it's been a ton, and that'll be a theme in this game preview, talking about some of the injuries that occurred this week in practice as we head into week one. Obviously, no T.Y. Now, Rhodes is going to be out, so there's a lot of injuries, as we always have. Naheem Hines, 48 for 48, his first three years in the league, plus the playoffs, hasn't missed a game, has caught 170 passes in three seasons, 60-plus with Luck, 60-plus with Rivers. The only year he was under 60 receptions was with Jacoby and Hoyer back in 2019, which obviously makes sense why his numbers, the receiving numbers, will go down as everybody's receiving numbers went down in 2019. But he's a durable piece, a good part of that 2018 draft class, the class that he really used as a building block to get the roster we're currently witnessing today with Leonard, with Nelson, and Nelson's extensions obviously coming next year. He's going to be if not the highest paid guard, maybe the highest paid offensive lineman in football when he signs his extension. Naheem Hines, a big part of that class as well. So good for him. Great guy on and off the field. Leader in the locker room. Durable. Great receiver out of the backfield. Special teams contributor. Excited to have him now locked up. I didn't see this getting done, Jason, before the season. I knew we would get Leonard done. I knew we would get Smith done. I didn't think we would get Hines done. But it's a nice little pleasant surprise a couple days before kickoff. Yeah, no question. And and the thing about it that I, that I really like is he's a homegrown guy. He's worked his way up the depth chart. And as far as – just to go back to what you said, yeah, I mean – I didn't expect it to get done either. They've been talking all off season as, you know, they did with Darius and Braden and they wanted to get him done. But I think it was when they restructured Kelly's deal that they were, they got really close. They needed that money obviously for Naheem. So they get that Kelly restructure, they get Naheem done. And, you know, like I was saying, he he's just a guy that came in and, and really worked his way up the depth chart, earned everything that, that he's gotten was not given anything. Came in, actually struggled a bit in his first preseason, fumbled a couple punts, didn't let him let it get him down, came back, and he's been solid ever since. He, I mean, no fumbling issues, great out of the backfield. I do wish Reich would use him more in the slot, especially this year, now that they're missing T.Y. They don't have a lot of quickness on the field, so I think they, they could really use that this year. Hopefully they will. But as far as Naheem goes, he, he's a great teammate, a great team player, can return kicks, punts, can you can put him out in the slot, and he's great running the ball. Just an outstanding player, definitely deserved the money, and I'm happy to have him back. He's a Swiss Army knife, and there's not a lot of guys like him in the league, and, and he's a special kid, great attitude, and I'm glad to have him back on, on the team for that extension. Three more years and, and plus this one, and uh, it's exciting because you got him and Taylor. That's quite a little tandem they're going to have. No question. And we bring Mac back and you have Wilkins and we got Jackson back to the practice squad. If there's one position on this roster that is solidified, it's the running back position up and down the depth chart. Every guy could play. So it's definitely a position you feel good about in comparison to a couple other positions. We don't feel so good about like the corner position, at least heading into this game because it hasn't had the greatest off season now with the injury to Xavier Rhodes. And we're starting this thing off with the Seattle Seahawks offense. So it's going to be imperative 
that these corners step up in this game because they have a couple of really good wide receivers when you look at Tyler Lockett and you look at DK Metcalf. But when you look at the Seattle Seahawks offense, it's obviously led by, I almost called him MVP caliber quarterback, Russell Wilson, but he's actually never even received a single MVP vote, but he threw 40 touchdowns last season. He was second in the league in touchdown passes. He's one of the best in the league. And one of the best we'll see this season as Russell Wilson leads the Seattle Seahawks offense into week one against the Colts defense. Yeah, you mentioned the the wide receiver tandem. That's going to be huge in this game. You got Lockett, who I loved coming out. And then you got Metcalf, who I was very wrong about. He's actually turned out to be really just more than I thought he could ever be already. So, And they're very physical. Very Lockett's more quick than fast. Metcalf is... I mean, he's you saw that, you know, that elite speed when he ran down Buda Baker last year. He's he's been outstanding since he's come into the league. But like you mentioned, man, it all begins and ends with Russell Wilson. I mean, you know, the thing with Russell Wilson is he doesn't really get outside the pocket to run that much. It's more to look down the field. And when he's looking down the field, it's not just five or 10 yards. He's looking 50 yards down the field. That is my concern with this game. I don't think it's going to be a game where the Colts struggle to get pressure. I think they will get pressure, but Wilson is so elusive. He's just such a tough guy to stop. He's, he's, uh, he's so quick and he's just a tough guy to get on the ground. So, I mean, they're going to have to really play through the whistle and and stay focused and locked in on defense because no, no play is over until you get this guy on the ground. And, uh, you know, you look at their offense. We mentioned the receivers. They, they brought in Gerald Everett from the Rams. He's going to be a solid addition to their offense. And then you got running back Chris Carson, who does pretty much everything. He can run it. He can catch it out of the backfield. So it's it, this is a tough, tough matchup for the Colts' defense out of the gate. The one spot I do think the Colts have an advantage is, is in the trenches. I do think the defensive line for the Colts has a, has, has a big-time advantage over the Seattle offensive line. Dwayne Brown, really good player, but he hasn't played at all. So he's going to be rusty. So I think we have an advantage there. And then, you know, I think DeForest is is just a monster. Whoever has to block him is going, going to be in for a long day. So I don't think it's going to be an issue of getting there. I think it's going to be an issue of uh, of sticking to our sticking to the receivers because we don't have, you know, Rock has moved up one, Kenny. Now you're going to be playing TJ. And then your backups are Isaiah and whoever they bring up, I guess, from the practice squad. I mean, I have no idea, but that's the issue in this game. Are we going to be able to contain their wide receivers? And it, I mean, on paper, I mean, and based on what we've seen, Luke, I mean, it, it, it the answer is probably no. Yeah. And starting our keys to the game, like you said, the Colts' biggest advantage defensively is in the trenches. Key number one, dominate the line of scrimmage, win the battle up front, make the corners' jobs easier, make the secondary's job easier by putting pressure on Wilson, getting into the backfield, and disrupting the timing and the pace of that offense so you don't have to have a guy, whether it be Rock Yassin or TJ Carey, cover for four or five, six seconds. So the quicker we get back there, the better. And key number one, dominate the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I mean, this you got to reestablish the line of scrimmage. Back, you know, a yard or two back, take away the run. I think they can do that with their front four. Darius, obviously, and, and Bobby taking away that stuff. But it's, it's going to come down to getting, you know, pressure on Wilson and keeping him in the pocket. The last thing you want is this guy getting outside the pocket because he draw you know, he can draw the play out, allow his receivers to get down the field and make long plays and he's very accurate deep. So definitely dominate the line of scrimmage, make them one dimensional. It all starts up front with these four guys and and we have the players to really make this a a tough game for the Seahawks. It's just a matter of getting it done. So I like our our advantage on the line and we've got to take advantage of it. We've got to take advantage of our skills on the line and, and the guys that we have there. Pay, I think, is going to have a good game. DeForest is DeForest. Grover's been playing well. And then whoever's at the other end, whether that's AQM or Banigou, obviously Teray is not going to play. So it's going to be one of those two guys. you got to get pressure on the quarterback. So we'll see what happens. But I do like our advantage at, at the line of scrimmage, and that's certainly a key for this game Sunday. Absolutely. Key number two, you touched on it during key number one, keep Russell Wilson in the pocket. He is so good at keeping his eyes downfield and he's so elusive. He's so slippery 
He's just a great all-around quarterback, and that is what he's best at. That's his bread and butter. So you really want to keep him in the pocket in this game. You want to push the pocket back. You want to keep him in the pocket and hopefully collapse the pocket so you could contain that offense. Key number two, keep Russell Wilson in the pocket. No question. And like you mentioned, he's always got his eyes downfield. He's not looking to run. He's looking for those big, big 50-yard passes. And he's got the guys you know, in Lockett and Metcalf that can make those plays. So keeping him in the pocket, pinning him inside and not letting him get outside the the tackle box is going to be very important in this game because he's at his best when he's out there doing that and ad-libbing and looking down the field. And and, uh, so definitely keeping him in the pocket is key. He's going to make plays, but he can't, we cannot allow him to consistently get outside and, and, you know, throw for 350 yards on, on six passes. You know what I mean? We've got to buckle down and make sure we stay on our keys and keep him in the pocket and we got we have a chance to get him on the ground get him on the ground because if you don't he will 100 percent make you pay and key number three as two stems from one three stems from two no big plays if you let him get out of the pocket he's going to make big plays he's been doing it since he entered the league in 2012 so you want to keep him in the pocket and then you want to eliminate big plays the big passing plays downfield to lock it and to dk and not just plays on receptions on yak but also rocky asin in particular, no holding, no pass interference. I don't want to see them move the chains on a pass interference because he's getting burnt. So Rock especially because he's been so handsy in his career, and it's either one or the other. He's either getting beat and it's a 60-yard touchdown, or he's getting beat and he's grabbing the guy and it's a 60-yard PI. So especially with that spot foul in the NFL, it seems like Rock is continuously on the wrong end of these. So key number three, no big plays, no big receptions downfield, and no big penalties from Rocky Asin. Yeah, this is definitely going to be the toughest of the three, in my opinion, because you've got two outstanding receivers going up against, you know, Rock, who, like you mentioned, struggled, you know, no Xavier out there. I think it's going to be really, really important for our safeties to give help and not get beat over the top. And it's super important for our linebackers to tackle, especially with Metcalf. You've got to get him on the ground. And and they have players that can make plays all over the field. Everett is a good player at tight end. I mentioned Carson. The two receivers are the guys we've talked the most about. But they've got players everywhere. And you, they Colts have to tackle well. They cannot come out the gate like they did in Jacksonville last year and not tackle well and be flat and, and all that. They do this in the this. They do play like they did last year in this year's game. They'll give up 40 plus points. They've got to come out firing this year. And they it starts with tackling, focusing on your keys, not, you know, like we've mentioned the three keys, the third one being the big plays. I'm expecting they'll probably give up one or two, but you cannot give up more than that. You've got to be able to keep everything in front of you, make the tackle, make them go the long way for the for the points, maybe hold them to field goals. But that starts with not giving up big plays. I really think a key to this game within the key is going to be our safeties helping our corners because one-on-one there's, I mean, you just can't, they're not matching up with those guys. So we're going to need help from our linebackers, obviously in the passing game and also our safety. So at the end of the day, all of this is to say we cannot give up big plays again. One or two is okay if they don't end up in the end zone, but no, like you can't have like three house calls on 60 yard plays. Mm -hmm. We're not going to win. So Limiting big plays to no big plays is, is probably the best way to say it. No big play touchdowns, especially those kill us. And uh, so, yeah, Luke, like you mentioned, man, Rock has got to play well. He's got to stop the grabbing, and and you know he's really, it's been either or with him. He's either getting beat for a touchdown or he's grabbing, and that's not good. And this is not the game for him, I don't think, because these guys, especially DK, is physical as hell. Yep. And Rock likes to play that way, but he oftentimes gets caught being way too handsy. So he's going to have to really be focused in this game, as will all of our secondary guys, because these two receivers are as good as they get. But as far as like, you know, the, the last big key for the Colts defense, no big plays. I mean, it goes without saying every game you don't want to give up big plays, but especially in this game with who we're playing at quarterback and with our offense kind of not having played together, you don't know how they're going to look. So points you know, probably going to be at a premium. So we really have to, you know, focus and get this thing done and shut down the big plays. 
Yeah, and I was going to say it, but you kind of touched on it as you were talking. I was going to say it's not even no big plays. It's really limit the big plays. When you go up against any great, like if you go up against LeBron James, you're not going to completely shut him down, but don't let him have 30 12 and 9 you know what I mean so you want to contain him to the best of your ability when you're going up against Giannis and when you're going up against whoever it might be in the NFL obviously you're going up against DK you're going up against Lockett you're going up against Wilson Carson you want to contain this offense and it's a high flying it's a home run hitting offense so taking one or two away could also be the difference, but you don't want to get beat for seven, of course. So you want to keep them out of the end zone and you're going to give up one or two. It's just inevitable when you're going up against a great offense, you're going up against great players, but you really want to limit those big plays in this game. And then situationally, you don't want to give up the big play at the wrong time, of course. And that goes for any game. If you're in a three point game, you obviously don't want to give up a bomb with two minutes to go in the game. Flipping sides of the field now to the Seattle Seahawks defense. couple really good players on this side of the ball, but not a great unit collectively. Last year, the defense kind of held back the team. This is not 2012. This is not 2013 with the Legion of Boom 2014 when the Seattle Seahawks were a Super Bowl contending team. It's kind of it's actually really funny, Jason, how they flipped because in the beginning of Wilson's career, he was more of a conservative game managing quarterback. They had the great defense and the defense kind of won them games and Wilson just controlled it on the offensive end. And then throughout the course of his career, we've seen a complete shift where now the defense is kind of getting bailed out by the offense and they have this great offense and then the defense is trailing behind, but they still have some really good players like Jamal Adams coming over in a trade last year at strong safety from the New York Jets. And then the heart and soul of that defense, Bobby Wagner. He's been there since 2011, I want to say. He's a six-time first-team All-Pro. He's a future first ballot Hall of Famer. One of the best to ever do it. When we talk about the top linebackers in the league, the only guy I usually give the opposition when I'm talking about Darius Leonard, if we're making the case for Darius Leonard to be the best linebacker in football, the only guy you really always have to tip your cap to is Bobby Wagner and everything he's been able to do in his career. And he leads the Seattle Seahawks defense into week one. Yeah, Bobby Wagner's special. He's a great football player. As far as the defense goes, they're not a spectacular defense. They do a lot of different things, though, that could give us trouble, they, especially when we've got Davenport out there and, and, and other players that haven't played a lot this in this really, really at all in the training camp and preseason. They bring different packages. They dummy a lot of blitzes. They do a lot of different things. Carson has seen Seattle's defense before, so that should help him. But it's it, it, they do, you know, when you look at them on paper, you're like, OK, they got Wagner, they got Adams, not a lot else. But they do a lot of different things. They play a lot of different guys and they, they'll bring blitzes from different places and disguise things in certain ways. So it's going to be an interesting chess match between the D.C. of Seattle and Carson Wentz, uh, having not played, you know, at all, really no live games since he I mean, since last year, really, it's going to be a test. And it's going to be tough for, for Wentz in his first game. This is not an easy game because they bring a lot of different style pressures and, and looks and packages. But there will be plays to be made. There are going to be openings. Their defense is not – it's not a top five defense or a top ten defense. They have top five talent as far as those two players. I mean, Bobby Wagner and Jamal Adams, you got to know where they are, period, both of them. They're big-time playmakers, and they'll change a game. But – Outside of that, this is a workable game for the Colts. So they've got to, you know, come in and really have their game plan down and be focused on what they're doing and identify those two guys and go from there. Uh, but as far as just an overall defense, they're average. I mean, I, I don't know what they're going to be this year. This is the first game, but last year they were average. They weren't, I mean, they weren't great, but they do have two really, really great players. And you got to know where both of them are. And, and that I think will probably be, you know, one of the things the Colts are game planning is knowing where Wagner is and knowing where Adams is. Because when Adams is up in the box, trying to run the ball is almost, you know, I mean, you, you might as well check out of it and go to a pass because it's almost impossible to run on when you got Adams up in the box and, and all that stuff. And they'll, they'll bring him on blitzes. They'll do all kinds of things with him. He, he's a great player. I mean, that's all you can say. And uh, so, 
you know, it's going to be a fun game. It'll be interesting to see how the Colts do in this week one matchup, but they've definitely got their hands full with those two guys. Yep, like you said, the Colts are most likely game planning for that. And here for the culture, we are game planning for that as well. Key number one, know where Jamal Adams is at all times and know where Bobby Wagner is at all times. Obviously, those two players are the heart and soul of that defense. You need to know where they are at all times, especially, like you said, with Jamal Adams, because if he's in the box, you're going to want to check to a pass because he can make so many different things happen, whether it be blitzing or picking up the run. I mean, he is a great player as well since coming over from the New York Jets. Key number one, know where Jamal Adams and Bobby Wagner are at all times. Yeah, and when I broke down you know, the their, their defense to start off here, I kind of went through that. And that, that's really, I, I think, where you begin with this, with this defense. You've got to know, obviously, where Wagner is. Uh, he's a sideline to sideline guy can make all the plays and then and then Adams is is just a game wrecker if you allow him to make plays he will change the game uh and whether that's a blitz and fumble pickup or whatever he's a really special talent I, I think him being in his second year in this defense is going to be big for him I think he's going to be even better this year than he was last year and they're going to use him a lot of different ways so the Colts have to know where those guys are I mean it's just like any great player you have got to account for them whether that's with two blockers or whatever that's up to them but they have to know where those two guys are because you know they make plays that's I mean we've already talked about how great Bobby Wagner is the guy's a first ballot hall of famer he's he's there basically he's their Darius Leonard or maybe Darius Leonard's our Bobby Wagner but Whatever the case, he's a great football player. Jamal Adams is just getting started in his career, and he's already made a name for himself. So those two guys, I mean, you've got to account for them, and if you do that, you got a shot. But if you don't and you let them wreck the game, as Chuck would say, it's going to be a long night or a long day for you at the office. So definitely the first key for us is definitely knowing where those two guys are and taking care of them, whether that's in the run game or the pass game. They have got to be accounted for. Key number two, taking care of the football, no turnovers jason what was the stat last year were we eight and oh when we didn't turn over the football i think we were there was i think there was one game where we had no i think we were on the yeah you're i think right. we were undefeated we were and undefeated, then yeah. on the flip side we were like three and six or something like that three and five with turnovers yeah. and then eight and oh without turnover so it was an incredible record we had when we didn't turn over the football so that's key number two, and that won't change week to week. I don't care if we're playing the Seahawks. I don't care if we're playing the Jaguars. When we play, one of our keys will always be to hold on to the football because last year we were literally undefeated when we did not turn over the football. Key number two, hold on to the rock. Don't turn over the football. Yeah, and I mentioned this this week especially because it's Carson's first game, and we know how bad he was last year. He was a turnover machine. He's just got to take what the defense gives him. Allow the players around him. And, and the argument everyone makes is he didn't have a lot around him last year in Philly, and that's fair. I'll give him that. But he also didn't play well. He's got to allow the guys around him, Jonathan Taylor, Naheem Hines, Zach Paschal, Mike Pittman, those guys, Paris Campbell. Let those guys make plays for him. He doesn't have to be Superman. There is talent on this offense, even without T.Y. Hilton. So just make the plays that are there. Don't try to force things because that's when you get into bad habits and that's when you turn the ball over. So just make the plays that are there. If there's nothing there, throw it away. Live to see another play. Don't turn the ball over. Obviously, this is a game. You might be able to beat some bad teams turning the ball over, but I, you're not beating Russell Wilson giving him extra possession. So this is a game, specifically the first game, that we have. We get to see Wentz, and, and he's got to just go out there Keep it simple, play his game, and and allow the guys around him to make plays. If he does that and we can keep the, the turnovers down, it, you know, no, nothing more than one maybe, that then we have a great shot at this game. It's going to be a competitive game, but we can't have him playing hero ball and making some of the throws he made last year uh, in this game. He's just got to let the game come to him and allow the playmakers on this offense and the offensive line, which is way better than the one he had in Philly, do their job. If he does that, I think we're in good shape, and I don't think he'll have any turnovers or you know maybe one, and that's a winnable situation. But if you start getting into two, three, anything past one, you're you're getting in scary territory. So just I'm saying no turnovers, but it, it, you know minimize them. Keep one at the most. You know we we want to have a chance to win the game, and I think if we can do that, we'll have a shot. And that's all you really want in the first game because neither team really knows what they have till they get out there and play. So 
Key number two, no turnovers. And key number three, dominate the line of scrimmage. It's a key on both sides of the ball, as it will be multiple times this year. Everything starts up front. Everything's about the battle in the trenches. We're looking at Davenport at left tackle. No Fisher in week one, although Fisher is well ahead of schedule, and we should see him back at some point in the month of September, hopefully by at least week three, when we go up against the Tennessee Titans in one of the biggest games of the season for the Colts. But dominate the line of scrimmage. Quinn Nelson, that Nelson over to Smith, you have... Nelson, Kelly, Glow, Smith. So those four have been rocking with us now going into year four, 2018, 19, 20, since I would say the middle portion when Smith really took over and Glow took over at their spots on the right side of the line. Nelson, obviously a day one guy from 2018. Now you plug in Davenport, who looked good at times in the preseason, dominate up front, win that battle, keep Wentz protected, be able to establish the run with Taylor in this loaded backfield. Key number three, dominate the line of scrimmage. Yeah, this will allow the offense to open up a little bit. You know, you could if you if you're able to to really take control of that line of scrimmage and reestablish the, the the line of scrimmage and push them back, you're able to run the ball. You can get into your short and inter intermediate passing game, and then once they roll up on on your guys you can you can take a shot deep and we have the guy this year that can actually you know no disrespect to phil rivers i love the guy but he couldn't really work the ball down the field like this guy can he's got an elite arm and that all starts with dominating at the up front if you can do that it allows you to do all kinds of different things and opens up your playbook um i think the colts have an advantage but that's kind of mitigated by the fact that julian davenport's out there he's played all right uh, he's not great run. He's not a great run blocker, but he is. He has played decent, pat, you know, in pass pro, which is good. As long as we can keep Carson clean and allow him to make his reads and his throws, we should be all right. Again, blitz pickup is big in this game. They're going to bring it from every angle. They're going to try to, you know, rattle Wentz. It's his first game. They're probably going to attack the left side of our line because Davenport's over there. So the Colts have to be prepared for that. But I still think with those other four guys out there, they have a chance to really dominate the line of scrimmage, establish Taylor, get Hines going, and, and just, you know, move the ball. The key to this game is just, you know, keeping the sticks moving, get down the field. When you get in the red zone, get in the end zone. In the preseason, it doesn't really matter, but we didn't get touchdowns when we got in the red zone. We literally kicked field goals almost every single time. So that's an important thing, too, that we did that I didn't list on the keys, but it's very important to get in the end zone once you get in that red zone. But as far as the game as a whole, I think it's going to be one at the line of scrimmage, and I think the Colts have an advantage there. And I think offensively, if Davenport can just hold his own and play decent, I think they have a very good chance to be able to open up the offense and get into you know whatever they want to do, whether that's the intermediate passing game, take some sh shots downfield, or, you know, trying to run the ball. I think they'll be able to do most of those things, but it all starts with being able to mitigate the pass rush, mitigate the blitz packages, all the different things that they're going to throw at them. And I think the Colts can do that and stay in this game. But it's, you know, how, how Davenport plays remains to be seen. So that's going to be that's going to be something to watch. But as far as just the overall, you know, key to this game and the key for the offensive line, definitely dominate the line of scrimmage is something very, very important to the Colts having a positive and successful game offensively. And you know what time it is, Jason. It's time for our For the Culture Week 1 predictions. And since everybody knows your prediction, I'll let you go first. <laughs> well, you guys know the rules. For those that are new, I'll give you a little background. I do, I'm probably going to do this every year on the show, so the new listeners will understand why I'm picking the way I am every single game. In 2019, I picked the Colts to beat Miami. You guys remember that was the Brian Hoyer game that we lost at home, and we went down the tank. At, we went down the toilet after that game, and I picked yes. the Colts to win. Then last year, in the first week, for some reason, I decided that that was the last year was the year we're going to win in Jacksonville for the first time since 2014. So I picked the Colts to win that game as well. Wait, but and Jason, Garner, how did Jacksonville do after week one? Oh, they did great. They won uh, zero games. They were <laughs> outstanding. <laughs> and when the Colts um, played the Jaguars for the second time, who did you take? I took the Jacksonville Jaguars. Attaboy. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, I did. And uh, just to, you know, go back and, and – Maybe you guys don't want to know this, but Joe Montana actually played that game at quarterback last year, went like 19 for 20 for 200 and some yards and three touchdowns and no picks. And I blame myself. I blame myself that we didn't get home, adva home field advantage because we lost that first game because I was so dumb that I picked the Colts. So with all of that said, in the background given, 
Obviously, I am picking the Seattle Seahawks. I think Russell Wilson has a big game. I think the receivers have a big game. I think Wentz is rusty. And I'm going to take Seattle 31-24 to at Lucas Oil. I think the crowd's going to be great. I'm excited to see you know fans back in the stands. But unfortunately, I think this is an L for the Colts. I don't think it's going to be quite as high of a scoring game as you think. I think it'll be a little bit lower scoring, maybe like maybe 24-20 something of that nature. I'm also going with the Seattle Seahawks. I actually am picking the Seahawks. There's no reverse jinx because of the Xavier Rhodes injury. If Rhodes was playing, I swear to God, I was going to take the Colts, maybe like 21-20, something like that. But I'm going to pick Seattle in this game only because I don't think we're going to be able to stop the passing attack. If we had Rhodes, I think we'd be able to slow it down a little bit better than we'll be able to this week because we were already concerned about CB2, CB3. Like I was already nervous about those spots. We weren't super confident besides left tackle until Eric Fisher gets back. The cornerback depth was an issue for this team. And now to see your number one corner go down, especially against this receiving core and this quarterback, I don't love the matchup. So I think that Wentz is going to come out a little rusty too, most likely. I think all that is fair because the guy hasn't played since the middle of last season. So he's going on, what, 10 months without playing football? So I'm going to go... 24-20 24-20 Seattle. Hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully we can slow down the passing attack. Hopefully the D-line is so active and we dominate the line of scrimmage and we push the pocket. Wilson did turn the ball over a lot in the second half of last year. Remember, he was an early MVP candidate favorite in the beginning of the year, and then he didn't get a single vote at the end of the year because he started turning the ball over. They were losing close games. So if we could create some turnovers, hopefully give Wentz a short field, establish the run, have Taylor play the way he was playing at the end of the season last year. There's definitely a path to victory for the Colts. I just need to see us stop the pass game, and I don't think we'll be able to enough to come out on the winning end. But again, I hope I'm wrong. We, we are at home, but when you look at the Colts' history in Week 1, we haven't won a Week 1 game since 2013, so I'm going with history. I'm going with just... You look at last year, we lost week one to the Jacksonville Jaguars, who finished the season 0-15 after week one. They finished 1-15 on the year. And we lost to them week one. And then we finished 11-5 and we made the playoffs. So I don't care who we're playing in week one. I need to see the Colts win a week one game before I pick the Colts to win a week one game. And hopefully this is the year they change that because it's been a long-ass time. And then our second week one win, you have to go back to the Peyton Manning era. I think 2009 is our second most recent week one win Yep. with Peyton Manning at quarterback. So you go through the entire luck era. You go through the year of Jacoby. You go through the year of Rivers. It's been a long time since the Colts were consistently winning week one games. Yeah. We need to see that. Yeah. It's crazy. Luke. I mean, we've won one game. It was against the Terrell Pryor led Oakland Raiders in 2013. Yeah, They had a receiver at quarterback. The last and time. we barely won, and we barely won that game. And then we to- lost Week One in 2008, right, Jason? That was opening Lucas Oil Stadium to the Bears. Yeah. Yes. We so, did. Yeah. and I know in 2006 we beat the Giants. I'm assuming we won our opener in 2007. Yeah, we blew out the Saints. We blew yeah. out the Saints. So we haven't won back to back, and obviously we're not even halfway there yet because we would need to win on Sunday yeah. and then win yeah. next year. But we haven't won back to back Week One games since the Super Bowl year into the following season. The RCA Dome. The RCA Dome. RCA We've RCA never Dome. won back-to-back <laughs> openers in the Lucas Oil era, and it's been open it's for over a decade. It's crazy. Hey, Luke, one thing I wanted to mention, you made a great point about how important the loss of Xavier Rhodes is, and when you break it down, I just wanted, wanted to mention this before we sign out. It's scary there at corner because TJ hasn't played that much. He's He's battling an injury. But he's going to start. Rock has been a train wreck. When he played in the Detroit game, he got beat for a touchdown. And then, you know, Kenny's consistent. You don't have to worry about him. But after that, you got Isaiah Rodgers, who doesn't have a lot of experience. So, I mean, that's scary. If Rock plays bad, TJ plays bad, I mean, I see no way with the guys they're playing against, with the quarterback that they're playing against, that 
that they're going to find a way to win this game. It's just such a horrible matchup yeah. as far as receivers go and just the the background of each Colts corner. I mean, they none of them have been really – Rock's been healthy, Kenny's been healthy, but then outside of that, Isaiah hasn't played much as far as start, being on the field. And then you look at, you know, TJ's coming off an injury, so it's just – the depth at corner is a problem. And if Xavier Rhodes, and what I'm being told, you can take this with a grain of salt, two or three weeks. So I would expect them back for the Tennessee game, but they still haven't determined what great strain this is. Yeah. So I don't, I, I'm not really sure if that's an optimistic view or whatever, but they're still determining his injury. If he's out longer than that, Ballard has is going to have to really make some tough decisions. You might, you, you've got to get a veteran in here yeah. if he's going to be up for it. And I think we forward. all have PTSD with the calf specifically in Indianapolis. Uh, of course, retirement so PTSD. Absolutely, and and whew, I don't know. It's just left tackle and corner, man. It's yeah. been a struggle. Well, I was just uh, about to mention, Jason. All offseason, it's about left tackle. It's about who's the backup left tackle. Then we signed Fisher. Fisher's probably not going to be ready week one. Obviously, he's not ready week one, even though he is ahead of schedule, and we should see him at some point this month. But that was the concern. All preseason, it's about who's going to play left tackle. Davenport does stand out amongst Holden and his very weak competition of Sam Tevy and, and Will Holden. But he was clearly the best of those three. He was the best of the bunch. And he's going to be your week one starter. That's not even my biggest concern now going into the game because at least right. matchup wise with Seattle, I'm so much more worried about the corner position and that is still on top of Davenport who did have a good preseason. Great credit to him. He's still going to have to go up against starting caliber pass rushers right. now against the Seattle Seahawks. So I'm going into this game more concerned about corner, but we could easily mid second quarter stop and say, dear God, there's an avalanche coming from the left side of this offensive line where Davenport's just getting killed on every play. And we saw it last year when we yep. had Chaz Green and we had LaRaven Clark and we had all those guys that were filling in for Costanzo. So that's still definitely a position to worry about heading into this game. I'm just – my focus has shifted now defensively to the corner position – but I don't want to minimize that we still have a backup tackle, albeit he played well in the preseason, at left tackle, which is arguably the second most important spot on the offense besides quarterback. And our quarterback hasn't played in about a year. So when you take all these factors in, this is not the best possible spot. And no T.Y. Hilton, you're down to number one wide receiver. So there's a lot to be worried about. But – we could come in Sunday night, Monday morning on the recap and you etch out a one point win all of a sudden poof goes away and we're pumped. We're optimistic about week two against the Rams. So unfortunately injuries are a part of the game. Unfortunately, right now they have their fingerprints on the game preview on paper. They affect this game, but hopefully they don't. Hopefully rock finally breaks out hopefully tj carey steps up he played well at times last year i actually thought that he was better than rock last year but hopefully they put it together they make stops the defensive line bails them out the defensive line pushes the pocket we create some turnovers wilson was turnover prone in the second half of the year last year hopefully that carries over and the offense could get it going we've seen reich now get a five and two start out of jacoby Brissett. And we saw him win 11 games with Phillip Rivers. And Phillip Rivers was awful his last year with the Chargers. Came over here last year as a 40-year-old man and brought this team to the playoffs. So we believe we have the coach, the offensive mind, to get it out of Wentz, to turn back the clock to 2017. And in unlike the Rivers case, despite Rivers being a Hall of Fame caliber player, you're talking about a 40-year-old man. With Wentz, you're talking about a 28-year-old. So... That shouldn't be a factor here where it's like this guy might just be done. You're talking about a guy in his 20s. So it's a lot different than a guy 39 going on 40. So there should still be something in Wentz for Reich to get out. And hopefully worse comes to worse in this game. Even if our predictions come true and the Colts come out on the losing end. Hopefully we see something where we could say, you know what? 
we could hang our hat on this. We sought things out of Wentz to be able to build on where this could be the franchise guy. We might have found our guy and just something now going into week two against the Rams. So definitely a lot to watch and a lot to be excited for in week one. Football is back. So football is back. Colts, Seahawks, week one, Lucas Oil Stadium, Fox. I'll let you give your closing remarks, Jason. Yeah, I just want to say this. I don't want anybody to think I don't think the Colts have a chance in this game. I absolutely think they do. I think the line of scrimmage is the biggest decider for, for them this, in this game specifically, only because I think it's going to allow them to take some of the pressure off of Wentz with the running game and a lot of other dif- different things offensively. So if they can do that, I think they've got a great shot to win. I just think that the corner problem is just something too much to overcome because you've got – I mean, you've just got the, the talent difference between the two guys they have out there and the two guys we're going to have covering them most of the time. And just in the way the zone works, I just think it's it is going to be a tough ask to control that offense with the with the guys that we're going to have out there at corner. I just think it makes such a big difference losing roads and it sucks. It's the week before the game and it sucks. It's right. Before, you know, I mean, it, he's probably going to miss multiple games. But that's the way it goes. And Seattle's completely healthy, so they've got that advantage. But I do still believe if the Colts can win the line of scrimmage, they've got a great chance to win this game. So I don't want anybody to think I don't think the Colts have a chance to win. I do. I just think Seattle's going to be a little too much for them offensively. And I think it's going to be a close game, but I think they win it in the end. But don't be surprised if the Colts pull it out. Yeah, and obviously that's what we'll be rooting for week one. Colts, Seahawks, week one, one o'clock. Fox, I'm pumped up. Football's back. It's that bittersweet, like, summer has to end, but when one door closes, another opens. It's football season. It's God's gift to us. Okay, I'm taking away the nice weather. It's going to get cold out, but you're also going to get football season. It's a pretty fair trade-off. So, football's back. Got off to a great start last night. I really enjoyed, I thoroughly enjoyed that Bucks cowboys game. And now we go into the weekend with a full slate of games on Sunday into Sunday night. Monday night, football's back. So it's a great time of year. And that pretty much wraps things up, Jason. So we'll be back Sunday night with the game recap. Enjoy the game, guys, whether you're watching on TV or you're going to the game. If you're going to the game, have fun, stay safe. And we'll be back probably late Sunday night into early Monday morning with the game recap. Hopefully, it's a Colts W we're recapping. That's my man, Jason Spears. I'm your host, Luke Diamond. And this is the For the Culture Podcast.